Good morning. Welcome to the IR Theory interview series. In this interview series, we interview IR scholars about their preferred theoretical perspectives. The idea is to get a brief account of why scholars have come to appreciate a certain IR theory through a short interview. Today, I have the honor to interview another great scholar. Welcome, Professor Frederick Söderbaum. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Very nice to have you. So uh, before we start uh, talking about the new regionalism and the new regionalist concepts, uh, could you please tell us a little bit about your scholarly background? Yes, of course, of course. In the early 90s, I uh, studied uh, political science and uh, economics in uh, Lund, at Lund University. So when I wrote the uh, MA thesis uh, on regionalism in, the, in Southern Africa, I was uh, quite uh, frustrated to uh, discover that there were uh, very few good uh, theories and approaches that could actually explain and uh, conceptualize the dynamics uh, that I uh, detected. And uh, part of the uh, problem lied, I think, uh, in the uh, disciplinary specialization of political science, of IR and economics. I wrote one thesis in economics uh, on the same topic. Uh, and there were a few good frameworks for understanding this type of new regionalism in the Global South, especially. So then in uh, 1994, I came across this uh, really terrific uh, project description by Björn Hetne, uh, a professor in Gothenburg. And uh, it opened up a whole new world for me. So I changed my master's uh, thesis uh, focus and aim and uh, did a completely different uh, thesis on the new regionalism. And uh, after writing this thesis, I, I uh, realized that uh, the best thing I could do was to uh, try to do a PhD mm -hmm. under uh, Hetner's supervision. So I moved, uh, I was happy to be accepted in Gothenburg. And uh, then I uh, have stayed uh, here in Gothenburg uh, for, uh, what is it, yeah, almost three decades. And uh, at the same department, we have shifted, we have transformed the department. But uh, so now I'm a professor in peace and development research. The PhD um, program was in peace and development. And it was uh, great uh, for me back then to uh, come to a, a very transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary academic milieu. Mm. And uh, we just combine different uh, subjects and disciplines uh, in like IR, peace research, development research and global studies and area research into uh, a big hole. And that was uh, very uh, exciting, uh, at least for me, coming from a monodisciplinary background in, in uh, Lund, at Lund University. Okay, so you... Um... You did your master's at Lund University? Yes, yes. Okay. And so, the, B, uh, the BA and the master's. Well, okay. A year in Canada as well in political science, but uh, uh, the, 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 it was an exchange year. So, uh, but Lund and, uh, yeah, Lund. Okay, yeah. I also did my uh, bachelor's and my master's at Lund University, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes. and I'm, I'm from Lund originally as well. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, that's really nice. But uh, are you from Lund originally, or are you from? No, no, no. I'm from Gothenburg. And okay, I from Gothenburg. To... <laughs> I moved to Lund. Okay, so you came back home for the PhD, and then you stayed. Yes. Yeah. All yes. right, that's nice. Okay, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, I mean, in some sense, I mean, I wanted to ask a question about new regionalism and what made you focus on that field of study. In some sense, you already touched upon that. Do you want to elaborate a bit further? What was it about new re new regionalism that was so fascinating? Yes, uh, yeah, of course, I can I can say uh, a few more words. Mm. Uh, I mean, like I said, the interest began early in my uh, during my BA and uh, MA st studies, and, yeah. uh, and uh, it developed from the fact that immediately after the Cold War, or even 
to some extent before the end of the Cold War. There was a lot of discussion about uh, regionalism and regionalization around the world. Uh, there was certainly something uh, exciting uh, with the uh, regionalization processes in Europe, but uh, also in uh, many other uh, parts of the world. And back then, in the 90s, one of the most important uh, uh, questions in IR was uh, the, re the um, relationship between uh, globalization and regionalization, or uh, um, whether we were moving towards uh, a world of regions and uh, so on. And my interest uh, derived uh, uh, especially from the fact that there was a strong strengthening of regionalism and regionalization, but uh, uh, we didn't have that many good theories back then uh, mm -hmm. that actually could make sense uh, of uh, what was happening and if we look at uh, if we looked at uh, mainstream theory in political science or IR uh, I don't think they were uh, very good uh, back then to make sense of regionalism in uh, the developing world or in the global south why uh, regionalism would uh, would uh, uh, strengthen uh, and uh, how it would look like because if you looked at uh, much of theories back then uh, it would say that uh, regionalism in the developing world was a failure. Uh, states were either too protectionistic or too much concerned with their own sovereignty uh, to be able to cooperate uh, well and uh, the regional organizations were uh, generally weak or poorly designed and uh, therefore uh, we could uh, sort of uh, expect uh, failure mm. and uh, that didn't correspond very w well to what I saw in uh, southern Africa for instance mm. which was uh, extremely uh, dynamic and um, I mean uh, the regional dimension was extremely strong in uh, southern Africa and uh, but the theories available were not that great mm -hmm. at uh, making sense of all this so uh, I thought that the toolbox uh, provided by Hetne or Hetne's perspective was uh, could make sense of this and I wanted to be part of uh, developing it. Mm. No, oh, fascinating. Uh, thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, but let's c continue with new regionalism for a while, because you are known for your research on new, uh, new regionalism. So if you are to choose three core new regionalist concepts, which ones would you choose and why? Yeah, interesting uh, question. And uh, I think that... Uh... Uh, linked to new, new regionalism and the new regionalism approach. Mm. Um, I think that uh, I would uh, pick uh, three, the following three. Regionalization is the first. Regionness is the second. And uh, uh, regime boosting would be uh, the third. Uh, now we should remember that uh, the new regionalism uh, approach is, is an approach. It's not a very uh, specific uh, uh, and narrow uh, um, causal theory. It's uh, like a perspective and it can, uh, uh, it's a broader toolbox. But uh, regionalization as a concept, the first one, is uh, pretty central because mm -hmm. uh, regionalization uh, as we understand it refers to the process uh, of regional cooperation and integration creating a region or regional space uh, or uh, denoting the uh, different activities of both state and non-state actors uh, and one important thing here is to distinguish it from regionalism, which was the main concept in uh, IR debates. Mm. So IR scholars would uh, primarily focus on regional intergovernmental organizations and 
what state actors do within these regional organizations. Regionalization is therefore a broader concept which is intended to transcend and go beyond uh, regional organizations. Because uh, Rios, they were, especially back in the 90s, they were what we said uh, second order phenomenon. They were not very uh, important at all. Uh, so what was uh, interesting what was instead we wanted to capture these types of processes and uh, activities that actually formed the region. So if you look at Southern Africa, for instance, you had pretty weak regional organizations, but a very strong regional dynamic, mm -hmm. what we would call the regionalization dynamic, mm -hmm. which included both state and non-state actors. Uh, it could be formal and informal, um, top-down and bottom-up, uh, including um, external actors who were very present in the region, for instance. Um, so uh, regionalism is not the same as regionalization from that point of view. Mm -hmm. and then the second concept that uh, is central to new regionalism uh, scholarship is uh, the concept of regionness that was coined by Björn Hetne, uh, I think, already in the 80s. He was informed uh, or uh, inspired by uh, discussions about stateness uh, and also the literature on imagined communities by Karl Deutsch. So Hetne was actually an economic uh, historian by training, so he looked at, uh, well, how does uh, region become regions? So the formation of regions in a rather uh, multidimensional and historical sense. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, if you look at the uh, r increasing levels of regionness in uh, Europe, it's a long-term historical pr process involving state and non-state actors. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore it, uh, sort of uh, was another second concept which uh, sort of uh, deviated from the very strong uh, focus in IR debates uh, on an economic de uh, debates in economics on uh, uh, trade agreements or regional organizations right so it's a much broader uh, broader concept mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, i mean uh, um, Hetne had several uh, versions of this uh, concept of regionness, which we developed in the uh, 90s uh, and early 2000. Uh, we, we played around with several different uh, uh, versions of it. Uh, but uh, the, the latest one is that, uh, I mean, how, how do you transform a region from a uh, we, can, we say we distinguish between social system, a regional complex, mm -hmm. uh, a regional society, a regi regional community into a, a fifth level, the regional institutionalized polity. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has been, um, it's quite frequently cited mm -hmm. uh, in, in the debate. Uh, now there is a certain limitation how to test region is mm -hmm. empirically mm -hmm. but uh, the the interesting thing is that uh, often uh, uh, younger scholars and phd students they take up this uh, they are inspired by region as concept and mm -hmm. uh, and they can uh, conduct uh, their phd thesis uh, around the world everything from uh, you know micro regions in uh, middle east to uh, Latin America, African regions, and uh, East Asia, and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's quite inspiring to uh, follow this sort of uh, the debate on regionness. But mm -hmm. uh, it was a long time now uh, that uh, since um, Bjorn and myself wrote about uh, this. Uh, so, so I'm thinking about, or an ambition is to try to uh, look uh, at the concept again and write a new article 20 okay. years what is it 20 or 25 years uh, after that would be a good update
<laughs> the, the last, uh, the last uh, concept uh, in uh, new regionalism, which I would want to bring forward, is um, regime boosting, which is uh, a concept uh, coined by uh, myself uh, at, when I did the um, PhD thesis uh, on Africa. Mm. Uh, quite some time now. <laughs> now we go to more than two two decades, early 90s, I, I coined it. Mm. Um, but uh, it, it sort of uh, was intended to capture something which uh, was not uh, well explained by mainstream uh, regional uh, integration theory, mm. uh, especially not by liberalist or liberal institutionalist theory or, or uh, even uh, realist or intergovernmentalist theory. So. So if we look at the liberal institutionalist theories, they would say that, uh, well, states, they cooperate in order to uh, achieve public goods or solve transboundary problems, so problem solving mm -hmm. to meet functional demands. Uh, well, looking at many places around the world, uh, states don't cooperate for these purposes. Uh, um, liberal institutionalists would say that regionalism has failed. Mm. Well, I, I, I would see, I could see that, uh, well, states in Africa, for instance, they engage uh, quite a lot in regionalism, but not in order to achieve public goods. Mm. So is that then a total failure or is it actually a deliberate activity? Mm -hmm. Uh, and the regime boosting mm. concept was in order to capture that people like that uh, uh, quite a number of uh, states uh, and political elites, they may build up uh, regional organizations for other purposes than uh, solving uh, functional, uh, functional problem solving. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this would be different also compared to intergovernmentalist or uh, realist uh, perspectives. Mm -hmm. Because uh, a core distinction would be between the national interest and the regime interest. Mm -hmm. So in uh, weak states around the world, we often make a distinction between uh, the conventional uh, realist uh, conceptualization of the state as uh, promoting the national interest, whereas in uh, some weak states uh, you have um, either authoritarian uh, regimes or weak state regimes uh, who uh, that may actually promote their own political interest, mm. which is not necessarily in order to promote the uh, broader public interest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so if you make that distinction, you could uh, sort of unpack what the regimes <clears throat> were actually doing and why they engaged so frequently and uh, uh, a lot in regional organizations, but without implementing. So why would uh, DRC under Mobutu be a member of uh, 60 regional organizations? That was uh, what drove me, for instance. Mm -hmm. Why would the weakest states be uh, part of uh, so many organizations that basically did nothing? Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, the regime boosting hypothesis would say that the, po the point is not to implement policies, mm -hmm. but to appear uh, important on the world scene. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, here I draw, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I uh, took inspirations from one of the greatest uh, Africanists, for instance, uh, Christopher Clapham. Mm -hmm. So uh, Christopher Clapham uh, said that, uh, how do states survive in the Westphalian system? Mm -hmm. uh, he said that uh, the, these weak states, they don't, uh, they don't uh, collapse they are instead able to use and instrumentalize the Westphalian system for their own uh, good, mm -hmm. their own survival. Mm -hmm. uh, and I saw that uh, quite clearly in, in uh, regionalism in, in Africa. And uh, it's kind of uh, interesting now to see that two decades later, we have a comparative debate on, uh, it's often framed in uh, authoritarian regionalism. 
uh, why do or uh, what do authoritarian regimes uh, gain from regionalism? Well, there seems to be quite a lot, uh, and this uh, can be known as uh, or referred to as uh, the dark forces of regionalism, which is um, yeah, uh, interesting debate. And uh, I think that the uh, strongest debates here are on uh, Eurasian regionalism, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about uh, next week, uh, I'm invited to uh, some uh, uh, conference on uh, Eurasian regionalism, and I will speak about uh, state uh, regime boosting. Mm -hmm. Like Shanghai Cooperation Organization or uh, the Eurasian Economic Union? Yes, yeah. yes, mm. yes. Mm. Uh, and there are different, there can be different types of regime boosting, I think. Mm. Mm. Okay. I mean, one which is uh, quite frequent in Africa is that why, why do they, for instance, uh, sign, they can sign like uh, 50 protocols of the Africa Union, mm -hmm. but then they only ratify 10. Mm. So why do, why do you have this gap between signature and uh, ratification? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a institutionalist uh, perspective or uh, answer would be that, uh, well, there is some sort of uh, uh, capacity weakness somewhere. Mm -hmm. You uh, would want to strive towards ratification, but you are too weak to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, this gap seems to be deliberate. There is a logic where you can uh, sign a lot of agreements, but uh, you don't have the intent or uh, uh, its uh, ambition mm. to actually ratify them. Mm. Or so, it's, them. so it's not really about capacity. No, mm. Mm. no. Okay. Mm. All right. Uh, very interesting. But you also mentioned, apart from not being about capacity, you also mentioned that um, with the case of Mobutu that it was to appear important. And then you also mentioned uh, that it is about survival. So the survival aspect could be some kind of realist aspect. Mm -hmm. Capacity aspect could be the liberal one. Appear important could be perhaps a constructivist one or um, something that at least relates to prestige or reputation or recognition. Um, yes. Is that is that correct? Is that what you want yeah. to say with when you say appear uh, that it's about yeah, appearance? Because uh, yeah, because I mean, uh, how do you actually strengthen your regime? Let's say in Africa, mm. uh, how do you appear important? Mm. Uh, and ultimately, how do you survive as a political regime? Mm. Mm. Well. Um, to appeal, uh, uh, to uh, sign these protocols mm -hmm. and uh, appear as a driving force of pan-Africanism mm -hmm. is a way to stay in power. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, so if, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. no, so survival then goes beyond the narrow uh, realist understanding of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, survival... In the sense of, let's say you have to have a, a functioning regime with uh, coercive capacity and so on, um, and also infrastructural power. But here we have um, a constructivist dimension to survival. Yeah, that, yeah, that if, if I mean, cannot... look at uh, look at uh, Mobutu. Mm. There was nothing mm. in uh, uh, DRC or former uh, Sair mm. that actually corresponded to a realist um, or ve very little that mm -hmm. corresponded to what we would say as a realist uh, definition of uh, uh, st uh, state to make it survive yeah right? mm -hmm. uh, the infrastructure capacities and, and resources to make it the yeah. state yeah, but yeah. still, it was the regime was uh, pretty influential in in uh, DRC, and it and it managed to survive for so long. Mm. How come? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so these uh, the regime boosting hypothesis is really uh, uh, drawing on um, uh, African politics theory, mm -hmm. because in African studies we have uh, discussed for uh, quite a while why uh, how come that these <laughs> regimes actually survive mm. uh, 
the weak states. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. Yeah, interesting because uh, Mobutu didn't control the whole territory. Uh, oh. the, there was uh, a huge lack of infrastructural or administrative power depending on what concept you would like to use. And the nation as a hegemonic idea uh, did not exist either. Um, so uh, interesting. Um, and then regionalism becomes important or regional organizations become important because there you have this world stage. You have 60 different stages where you can appear important. Yeah. 60 different contexts and places oh, yeah. where you can perform uh, this role of an important leader. Uh, hmm. Okay, interesting. And then uh, I also have a question in relation to regionness, because you mentioned that it's quite hard to, I mean, you like the concept a lot and you have this nice uh, conceptual framework. Um, I think you mentioned five aspects to it, if I remember correctly. Uh, but then it's quite hard to test, you mentioned. Uh, and then you also said that uh, PhD students, they take up that challenge. So are yeah. you familiar with any concrete operationalizations of regionness where we can actually, okay, this is the concept of regionness. This is how we operationalize it by turning it into observable indicators. What what are they focusing on on the empirical side of uh, research that relates to that concept? Yeah, uh, the, good question, and uh, and it's actually quite fun to uh, for me as being part of. Uh, I mean, I worked with uh, Bjorn to develop the concept and uh, try to take it forward. Mm. But, uh, we we were uh, quite. Uh, for us, uh, we saw it as a heuristic tool, mm. and we were very uh, uh, sort of uh, careful to say it's a concept. Mm. Um, of course, it's a sort of like uh, part of a very uh, sort of uh, uh, perspective where we have different levels or degrees of regionness, mm -hmm. of course. Um, uh, but the, impo the interesting thing is that uh, it's uh, picked up by quite a number of scholars mm. around the world, um, but uh, no one uh, uh, operationalizes it in the same way. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, because you have to, you have to uh, sort of, I mean, how do you actually um, uh, study empirically uh, how a region becomes a region mm. uh, a, in the uh, in this uh, rather uh, comprehensive and societal uh, way mm. I mean, uh, of course you have to go beyond uh, regional organizations and take into account uh, societal processes of regionalization mm -hmm. uh, and that can be operationalized mm -hmm. but uh, uh, it, it's uh, that the different uh, PhD students or younger researchers, they, they tend to do it uh, differently. Some look at, uh, you know, base, mainly security dimensions. Uh, others may emphasize the economic aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, then a way to go about is to sort of uh, have uh, a lot of focus still on uh, regional organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, you may pick uh, like overlapping regional organizations and, and uh, you see how these organizations sort of can mediate different interests. But uh, uh, yeah, there are diff diff certainly different uh, routes. And then it is also that uh, it, region has becomes uh, it must be have some sort of contextual sensitivity mm. so um, even if uh, the same person uh, would study different regions it might uh, and do case studies it, mm. it might be operationalized uh, in a slightly different uh, <laughs> ways but that that's why i would want to i've thought about it for a long time to uh, well uh, how to redo it and build on uh, all these experiences uh, in order to move towards a more coherent uh, construct, which mm -hmm. can also be uh, perhaps uh, a bit more coherent uh, for cumulative uh, research compared to <laughs> in the past. Mm. 
you you have to do a big meta study over the uh, uh, region nest studies. Yes, and yes. see what no, you come I'm, up. Uh, I'm actually collecting uh, yeah. collecting uh, quite a bit of material, and yeah. uh, quite often, um, I mean, let's say a PhD student uh, uses the concept. Uh, yeah. I'm invited to uh, be an examiner or uh, or so on, or, okay. or uh, review the book proposal or something like that. Mm. Okay, oh, that's really nice. Uh, I, I have one last question in relation to, to new regionalism and regionalization processes and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and this might, um, I don't know. Um, uh, where comes, where does capitalism come in? Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, regionalization as an economic process with regional production networks where i mean japan outsourcing economic activity ec economic uh, activities to southeast asia uh, germany outsourcing to eastern europe united states outsourcing to mexico and nafta for instance being very much an economic process um, where does capitalism come into to to new regionalism in the case of Southern Africa, for instance, where you, what you are, which is a region that you have studied a lot. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, perhaps in very there are different alternatives uh, mm. for this, uh, different uh, ways to uh, handle it. Mm. Uh, so from the in the very beginning, uh, uh, when Hitne developed new regionalism, it was that. Uh, uh, he he uh, he he's a, uh, his guru is uh, Polanyi, Karl Polanyi. Mm, mm. So uh, he uh, sort of uh, framed the whole new regionalism project in terms of that uh, it was a political response against neoliberal uh, globalization. Mm, mm, uh, I see. It is the same uh, kind of Polanyi uh, dynamic. Uh, yeah. So, but uh, the political response was not on the nation state level, but yeah. on the regional level. So states would yeah. come together, and uh, regionalism uh, uh, represented the return of the political in the context of economic globalization. Mm. So, from that perspective, uh, Hetnes. Uh, uh, sort of competitors. He didn't develop his theory against uh, Ernst Haas or uh, the neo-functionalist. He didn't care that much about the integration theory. Mm -hmm. uh, he, 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 uh, his, uh, he had a global perspective. And, uh, you know, uh, from the 80s, you had the discussion about uh, neoliberalism and structural adjustment and mm -hmm. yeah. uh, like that. So it was a uh, um, world order theory. Mm. Uh, and mm. then we had a lot of discussion in the 1990s where uh, uh, Hetne and myself and other new regionalists, we uh, or new NRA proponents, mm. we argued and uh, tried to explore uh, uh, the return of the political, right? Mm. 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 Uh, whereas we had uh, some very uh, some friends and close scholars in Warwick, for instance, mm -hmm. where they pushed the world order approach, mm. and they said uh, we don't uh, discover any political mm. Mm. Uh, regionalism is part of economic globalization. Mm, mm, uh, mm. So it becomes uh, like a mechanism within cap uh, neoliberal capitalism. Mm. Uh, so basically, uh, like uh, trans like uh, Robert Koch speaks about uh, the mm -hmm. uh, state as the transmission belt for uh, transnational capital. Mm. So I actually wrote the uh, uh, interest um, one article quite some uh, long time ago where we asked the question actually where uh, about uh, smaller cross-border regional initiatives in southern africa mm. do they represent uh, are they a transmission belt for global capitalism mm. or are they a facilitator for development so we took this, uh, you know, the distinction by Robert Cox. Mm, mm -hmm. And in, in this context here, these uh, political economy initiatives, mm. 
quite, uh, quite a lot of them in southern Africa. They were clearly what we saw as transmission belts. Mm. And they, it was constructed by uh, some sort of uh, hegemonic bloc uh, from within South Africa with mm -hmm. uh, very close uh, ties between the political and the economic elite. Mm. But uh, th there are also other. So, so did, did I did I get that correctly? So then, in some sense, you buy into the Coxian critique if you because hegemonic bloc. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Okay. You okay. Can see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also, so you okay? So it was not that you rejected that critique. You, in some sense, you buy into it and see how it applies to to that region as well. Absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Uh, but then, yeah. I mean, I've explored. Um, it's possible, and uh, there's been quite a lot of a um, lot of uh, studies on civil society's role in regionalism, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and here we can see uh, several different outcomes where uh, sort of uh, civil society would act as uh, uh, actually uh, representing the counter hegemonic bloc. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, resisting uh, transnational capital or neoliberalism. Mm. And they exist also in Southern Africa and many other places of the world, but they are, mm. they are pretty weak mm. as a counter-hegemonic -hege bloc. Mm. Yeah, maybe uh, not in a counter-hegemonic bloc in that sense, but at least a counter-hegemonic struggle and um, counter-hegemonic yeah. movements. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Not, not the bloc in mm, that sense. Yeah. They would uh, favor uh, yeah, the norms uh, embedded in, in, in some sort of uh, in the movement. Mm. Yes. But I really like that starting point. I mean, in some sense, you take Polanyi up to the regional level. Mm. Uh, and, and, and that is actually where Hetne uh, got his basic understanding from. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, he couldn't sleep without Polanyi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so quite yeah. often, yeah. I, I once asked him, uh, he, he wrote this, uh, I mean, he wrote, uh, he was very prolific. Yeah. But uh, once uh, he had this... Um, uh, draft or article uh, uh, where he once again used Karl Polanyi, but uh, also some other concepts. And, mm. and I asked him, why do you have to bring Polanyi into uh, this article? I mean, uh, I'm not sure it really fits. Uh, and it was uh, at the draft stage. Yeah. His, he, his answer was, Fred, you know, I can't sleep without Polanyi. <laughs> okay. But, yeah. I I have to bring him in. Yeah. So so what what do you make of the current uh, uh, state of the world that we're in? Do we uh, are we in a phase where we need more uh, societal regulation of market forces? Of course, we need um, we need uh, more and better governance. Oh, okay. I think. Mm. Uh, what uh, I mean, if we compare to the 90s, then it was a uh, the debate was very much, well, should you have uh, global governance or should you have regional governance? Mm -hmm. And uh, the question was whether, uh, well, uh, w what were the signs that uh, you could comp uh, develop comprehensive uh, regulatory mechanisms uh, on the level of uh, one region? Mm. Um, as a sort of way to uh, manage uh, global governance uh, issues, mm. right? Um, but today we have a much more uh, messier picture with, uh, uh, there are many different uh, ter terms for it, like uh, regime complexity and... Uh, yeah, yeah. multi-level governance. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So there are, um, so and there also on also the return of the state. It's not not the return. The state definitely never left. But uh, but yeah, maybe not just about global or regional governance, but about national governance or national gov government. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, increasing yes. protectionism uh, and national regulations uh, rather than regional ones necessarily. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, okay, definitely a uh, very interesting uh, perspectives. Uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, we continue.
Um, so um, thank you very much for those three core concepts and um, how we can think about them and how you have used them. Uh, in terms of policy relevance, how would uh, new regionalism inform policy? Yeah, uh, that's uh, a good question. Mm. And uh, it lies quite close to my heart uh, uh, because I'm, I'm engaged quite a bit in uh, policy making over the mm. last 25 years. Okay. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, you don't you don't discuss region as with policymakers. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> yeah. Have you heard about this concept? It's called region as. <laughs> Can we okay. construct a policy for region yeah, yeah, strengthening yeah. region as yeah. now? So so uh, what do you what do you do then when you talk to policymakers? How do you turn uh, academia into something more manageable for politicians? Yes, uh, I mean the, it, it often depends on uh, what type of. Uh, uh discussions you are you are in mm. but i've been uh, sort of providing some sort of advice for uh um, 25 years to for instance uh, the swedish uh, uh, development strategy or the regional development strategy with uh, africa mm. Mm. sub-saharan africa so mm -hmm. how should sweden provide uh, donor funding to uh, not only the AU and regional organizations, but uh, Africa as a region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I've uh, often discussed here is that, uh, well, uh, you cannot focus uh, solely on uh, regional, uh, intergovernmental regional organizations. Mm -hmm. Regions are more important than Africa Union. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes uh, you may have uh, uh, collective action problems uh, and uh, you don't have uh, intergovernmental organization that can actually handle this uh, collective action problem. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Well, uh, you cannot uh, build up a new uh, organization from outside. Um, you have to adjust to the collective action problem instead mm -hmm. and see uh, how to work with it. And uh, often uh, there are mechanisms or programs or something to respond to or even overlapping regional organizations. Mm -hmm. So you have to think uh, of the region instead of the regional organization. And that's uh, one thing I've uh, talked mm -hmm. about uh, for mm -hmm. quite a long time. Yeah. And I think, uh, well, it seems that I've... Uh, uh, that, that is some, interesting. some colleagues say that, or, or some um, um, uh, contacts in in CEDA that say I've, uh, I've uh, had some influence. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in terms of this, and I, uh, but sometimes they don't listen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because but, I mean, it would be quite easy for them perhaps to stare themselves blind on the formal regional organization because that that is where they find other uh, colleagues, other politicians, right? Uh, but if you focus on the region, what actors would you zoom in on instead? Well, uh, I mean, uh, what's the role of uh, non-state actors mm. who, who might be uh, active in, uh, let's say, a, a transboundary water um, water context or in in uh, the trade uh, debates for instance um, uh, but but i think that it uh, sort of uh, where uh, the discussion can become more concrete is uh, the understanding mm. of regional organizations mm. so i've been involved in in uh, policy debates as well with uh, well how to understand the African Union or mm. how to understand uh, what states do in uh, in uh, the various different uh, regional uh, state driven organizations. Mm. And uh, if you um, take on the mainstream idea that uh, institutions are there to solve problems, uh, then, uh, of course, then strengthen these organizations and build their capacities. Mm. But let's say now that there is a regime boosting logic. If you strengthen the organization, mm. you will not get um, <laughs> you mm. will not get problem solving out. 
Mm. It's not something else. Mm. Uh, and here uh, I've had quite uh, a number of interesting discussions with yeah. uh, policymakers because they can see both logics at the same time. Yeah. I mean, if you are in, in, a, in a donor, I've spoken to many donors. Uh, I mean, if, if you support, uh, I mean, you can have a strategy to support uh, regional organizations, mm -hmm. uh, VIA, for instance. Mm -hmm. But you can also see this logic where, uh, well, regime boosting logic or uh, something else, uh, a more uh, sort of destructive pattern. Mm. Uh, yeah. And they uh, can see that in their daily uh, work. Mm. So I often sort of uh, provide both perspectives and uh, I've uh, lectured for, for uh, uh, aid officials and, and so on, and they say, yes, this is the uh, uh, problems that we are experiencing and facing in our daily life mm -hmm. uh, or in di uh, daily work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then they turn to me, mm -hmm. how should we solve it? <laughs> and then you have to come up with a solution. Well, I can provide the uh, sort of uh, different perspectives and see that this is going on. Mm. But uh, I mean, um, yeah. But do, but do you also have the perspective of the recipient countries? Do you have the? Uh, I mean, I, I guess you have also engaged with uh, quite a lot. A lo I mean, the local politicians and the decision makers in the various countries. Uh, what is their perspective? Well, I've, I've uh, um, not. Uh, I mean, if we speak about Africa Union, for instance, or uh, SADAC, the Southern mm -hmm. African Development Community, mm -hmm. uh, they are not uh, that influential uh, in a village in uh, in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, um, there, I would see, say that these uh, sort of cross-border initiatives are much more uh, affecting the daily lives of Africans. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, a trade agreement may uh, possibly influence, have influence on, on, on the everyday life. But uh, in terms of uh, relationship to, to uh, an ownership, I think that uh, for the last uh, five years or so, I've, I've studied quite a lot the interaction between donors who support regions from outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. So they, uh, I mean, uh, Africa Union and SADAC and the ECOWAS, uh, they receive a lot of funding from the donor community. Mm -hmm. um, and then they become sort of engaged. The donors, EU, for instance, EU is very deeply engaged in trying to build regions and regional organizations in Africa. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the question occurs, well, can you build regions from outside and uh, what would, uh, what are the, uh, uh, what does this mean for uh, Africans, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. African ownership? Mm -hmm. So the ownership uh, issue is uh, quite, uh, quite topical and mm -hmm. interesting. So yeah. I mean, you had uh, Kagame, Rwandan president, yeah. he, he sort of launched a, uh, pretty uh, furious critique mm. of uh, <laughs> and created uh, conflicts mm. with the uh, uh, most important donors mm. Uh, mm. supporting the African Union and, mm. and he said uh, uh, we have to take care of uh, our own organization mm. Mm. You, uh, you you should not uh, interfere mm. Mm. Uh, and so on mm. Mm. Mm, I see. Uh, all right. Interesting. Uh, we have been talking for a long time now, so I will uh, go to the last question. Yes. Um, before we leave, any advice to our fellow IR students? Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, one uh, thing... Uh... I think is that uh, IO students, uh, students in um, general, they need to be curious uh, and perhaps a little bit obsessed mm. about uh, how, how the world uh, hangs together. Mm. Uh, and here I think that uh, 
I mean, if we speak about uh, IR matters and uh, and trying to understand how the uh, world uh, hang together, um, we need some sort of uh, even global perspective. Mm. Um, so a global perspective, a theoretical interest, uh, and uh, perhaps also pr being a bit uh, provocative here, uh, mm. forget about IR. Mm. <laughs> forget about IR. But that's forget a very about IR. No, forget <laughs> about the IR theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I think we need to go. Uh, we cannot limit ourselves to IR theory. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I would, my advice would be to uh, trespass uh, disciplinary boundaries, yeah, and uh, become uh, familiar and uh, follow other disciplines uh, as well. Okay, that, that's a very good uh, advice. So you should be curious and obsessed uh, about the world, and you should have a global perspective, uh, and you should also. Um, uh, transgress the uh, uh, theoretical boundaries uh, and then search wider uh, and uh, yeah, forget about I or theory maybe uh, at least the grand theories the mainstream grand theories uh, uh, might not help us too much perhaps mm -hmm. mm. all right that's very good uh, thank you very much for uh, participating and talking with me today uh, I really appreciate it Oh, it was uh, my pleasure as well. It was uh, fun talking to you and discussing. Yes. Okay. All the very best. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.